All right, Mijuxis, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. This is a program by and for indigenous people and our allies. So welcome. This is a class for folks who are ready for a new day for old ways. And we'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, which is something so many of us need at this time. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two-Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory in Colorado. Hi, I'm Brooke. I'm a um, Taino mother in New York City living in Matinecock territory. And I'm the host, one of the hosts of First Foods along with Desiree. And uh, we're just going to have some housekeeping items as we always do. But again, just welcoming everybody back for our Thursday sessions. And um, yeah, we'll get right into the protocols of the group. I don't know why this is sharing Sid's stuff and not my stuff. Hang on one second here. Well, all right. So we have a couple of protocols for the group, land acknowledgement, native knowledge, intertribal space, foraging and harvesting, food sovereignty, and then lastly, our disclaimer for uh, working within the program. So the first one is land acknowledgement. We recognize, uphold, and respect Native nations as their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiyala. Everyone attending the space must uphold the same. Native knowledge. So any person that's coming to this class, especially if they're non-natives, are not allowed to monetize or repackage the traditions and culture that are being taught by our teaching artists and cultural bearers. Uh, native knowledge systems belong to cultural communities. They come from and to the guest speakers in our programming and that should not be taken advantage of. Intertribal space. So we have many nations represented and pretty much um, we've had indigenous people from Canada all the way down to South America and the islands. So we just wanna keep in mind that each region is different. And so some foods that are desirable or undesirable to some might be, you know, vice versa to another group. And plants don't have specific geographic territory. So they also might have different names, different usages. And uh, we just want to eliminate the more Indianer or copyright type of culture in this group. Just respect that it's an intertribal space. So some things might be different. And as far as foraging and harvesting, always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. Remember, this also ties into land acknowledgement. Whose territory are you on? Whose ancestral territories are you on, whether they've been displaced or are still there? And also remember that some medicines may be seasonal and some medicines or food systems or plants uh, might be being left alone to replenish themselves. Uh, and also respect when you go to native communities and ask permission to utilize their land and their medicines, respect if the answer is no. Food sovereignty. So as we all know, through all the programming, first people have a very deep rooted connection with the lands that they're on. Our cultures literally are birthed from the earth and the territories we come from. And so therefore we have every right to hunt, fish and forage and harvest in our traditional t territories. And it's unacceptable, especially as a non-native to critique traditional or contemporary dietary systems, um, just because it's just not your place. That's actually performing settler colonialism. And that's one of the things that will get you banned and kicked out the group. And lastly, first foods is for educational purposes only before using ingesting any herb or plant for medicinal or culinary purposes, please consult a physician, medical herbalist, or suitable professional. As for First Nations people, Indigenous people, Amerindians, or Native um, nations, that would 
be you going to your medicine persons and making sure, especially urban natives, that you're following protocol and you're following the ways of your people? Okay, thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, give me just one moment here. So today we have a really interesting class, which is about Bapa, Wasna, and Timsila. We're learning about Lakota foodways with Sichangu instructor Sid Whitting. So arena director Sid Whitting Jr. is a Sichangu Lakota Northern traditional dancer and longtime powwow participant. He has been part of the Denver Native community and an advocate most of his life. He continues to keep the Native community a valuable part of the Denver cultural norm as a member of the Denver March Powwow, Amarind All West Indian High School basketball tournament, and Tall Bull Memorial Grounds. He is presently working with the University of Denver on the Native American Advisory Council. Sid is also a cultural academic presenter in a program that helps Native American high school students become college ready while instilling their traditional indigenous knowledge to assist them with math, culture, and environments classes. His main objective is to enhance the student's college experience in cultural science. Technology, engineering, arts, and math uh, in that setting. Sid's hope is to promote Native culture in a realistic light and for an offer, often misunderstood people. Uh, he will he works with the Master of Ceremonies to keep powwows moving smoothly. And currently, Sid is a cultural academics presenter working on K through 12 and higher programming. So that is Sid. We are so excited to introduce him. Um, just personally, I really appreciate Sid being in the community and uh, the role that he plays. So I am proud and honored that he will come teach us today. So from there, Sid, take her away. Tilamia Desiree, I'm Madapiapi, I'm Petu Washte, Sid Whiting, Imichiapi. Hello, relatives. Good day. My name is Sid Whiting. I'm Sichangu Lakota from South Central South Dakota, the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. But I currently live here in Denver, Colorado, and am a cultural academics presenter. I dabble in a lot of different things. I, I love to be with my native people, and I love the culture, and I live the culture. I am not only into what my ancestors have done, but I love to evolve the culture into a new, stronger, and viable, progressive culture. Uh, but today, I'm here to speak on indigenous foods, and in particular, indigenous food sovereignty and access to those foods. That is one of the I think the hardest things we uh, come across is access to our own foods. Uh, it's very difficult. The Lakota people, uh, my Tioshbae and my ancestors um, were hunter gatherers. Uh, we didn't do much farming at all, but we allowed the environments to continual growth by not harming them as we nomadically moved about the high plains and, and other spaces. Uh, basically, we, when, when we looked for our food sources and found those sources, we made sure not to over harvest or overtake gain. That was one of our, our I, I believe one of our strongest points, we had our ancestors had so much environmental knowledge, they were able to critique everything uh, that they did, all their movements, and it created such a flow that they were able to cycle that 
in the the different times of the year to harvest or to find certain game animals and and take those animals for uh, consumption. Um, I'm really here to discuss some foods, but access is is one of the things that I really believe that all tribes should uh, endeavor in, look into how we may make our indigenous food sources available, not only to our own people, but other tribal people. Uh, that's one thing I have found as an individual. I have found a lot of individuals wanting to trade the different foods and such as some some uh, beans here I got from a Diné friend, very old uh, variety she sent and I have tried some and they were very delicious. But something like this was always in our trade with other tribes and other indigenous peoples of uh, uh, Turtle Island or uh, the North Americas. Uh, today we're going to talk about, I guess I'll start with the buffalo. Uh, the buffalo was one of our main substances, uh, food sources, and it wasn't only that, it was meant everything to the Lakota. Uh, we do call the the buffalo and our language is tatanka uh, but we also have a name for them pete oyate the the term means the giver of of life the the motherly monarch uh, matriarchal being that brings life to all and gives her life for all. It's a very complicated relationship we had with the North American bison, or I prefer buffalo to call it. But today we are gonna talk about Bapa and Wasna. Those are two of the primary food sources we used to travel with. There was no refrigeration or anything of that source, so we had to find a way to utilize um, our knowledge in order to travel with the uh, buffalo meat and preserve it for many days. Um, the first one I will show you, um, bear with me here if a video gets a little, little funny here, but I'm going to show you some bapa, dried buffalo meat I am finishing today on a uh, fire pit. I'll show you what I got here. Can everyone see it? Did everyone get a look at it? I hope so. Can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> so basically that is meat drying. Once it's completely dried, I will use it to make a, um, Wahumpy, a soup. And normally uh, you would add wild turnips or timsila to that bapa. Uh, but you could add dried corns or, or any type of dried uh, uh, vegetable to it. And it is extremely tasty. Uh, it's very, um, very delicious and very nutritious. Uh, 
there's hardly any type of uh, fat on the the buffalo, so the soup itself is not very greasy at all. So it's a very lean meat, the buffalo. The bapa, the drying of the bapa can take place over days or it could be sped up by using a little bit of smoke and you could flavor that smoke with different types of, of uh, our, uh, sacred medicines. Um, you can use different types of wood to flavor it. I personally use apple and plum wood to give it a little fruity flavor. So when it is done, it'll be have this fruity flavor, an apple plum flavor to it. Um, there are a lot of natural ways you could prepare these foods. Uh, that is just one by using, utilizing the smoke and also the tenderness of them. The, the faster you dry something, the uh, a, a little bit harder, it, it, it becomes a little harder or tougher. So if you could slow dry it, uh, that's usually a better uh, way to use it. It becomes a little more supple, especially if you're just going to eat it off the rack as such. But if you add it to soup, it takes nothing to rehydrate it and cook it. Um, now, there's many other parts of that buffalo besides the bapa. I know our class today is on the three subjects of the uh, the bapa, the wasna, and the timsila, but I'd like to show a few things uh, real quick on the buffalo here after I showed the dry meat. I'm holding the femur bone or leg bone of a buffalo. And inside it is marrow inside the bone. You get about eight ounces of bone marrow from a buffalo leg bone about this size. Now it's very nutritious. It does a lot for a person. It, it can be eaten at about a pace of an ounce a day and sustain uh, a person. You're, you might be hungry, but nutritionally, you will still be sustained by that bone marrow that's in the buffalo here. This is something that I believe uh, has been lost in some of our eating habits when we, when we do harvest uh, game animals. We tend to just pick at the specific parts and we forget about some of the most nutritious and vital parts of an animal. And the marrow of some of these bones on some of the animals, such as deer, elk, buffalo, antelope, even cattle, uh, but we won't talk about beef, we're talking about buffalo and some wild game animals. Particularly, this is an antelope. And as you can see, you wouldn't get as much of the marrow out of a femur bone from an antelope. But it's still viable. And that is something that uh, there's some different ways to uh, create uh, things while cooking with it. Uh, they used to drop it in a bladder pot with some of the uh, bapa and wild uh, turnips or timsila. And then they would drop hot rocks in, in that particular uh, bladder um, pot that was crafted from a buffalo bladder and allow that to boil with marrow in there which gave it a more uh, richer flavor and very nutritious. Uh, so that is one way of 
uh, enhancing a suit uh, from um, the femur of certain animals. And you could just, by breaking that bone open, literally dig the marrow out also. But that helps in the flavoring the dried meat as it becomes rehydrated in the boiling water it'll also absorb some of the marrow's flavor and it is very delicious the second thing i want to talk about about the buffalo is wasna now the wasna i hope everyone can see that comes in a cake or a loose bit. It is made from buffalo. Uh, you could make it out of different types of the meat. Um, it is also dried like the bapa and is there's various things that's added to it. Now it's a like a super uh, power bar uh, I'm not sure if anyone heard of Tatanka bars, but at one time they were commercially produced by some native people early on and they were purchased by another company. But their power, their power bar was very similar to this food, wasna, and it's very delicious. It has it, different ingredients in it besides the buffalo meat. It has fruits or berries you may add. You can add blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, some nuts. You you may add uh, our, our people traditionally, my people, the Sichanghu and other Lakota people use choke cherry to make the wasna and it is very delicious when when made with uh, choke cherries, choke cherry alone with the wasna can be made with uh, other types of game animals, deer meat and such. Uh, deer and buffalo are my favorite wasna. And what I mean, we have problems with access. Uh, when we indulge in some of these food sources like wasna, a lot of times the the uh, we can only use them for special occasions and ceremonies because we don't have access to them or can't afford the cost of purchasing our own foods that we traditionally ate and utilized. Now that really works on against us as. Our, within our hereditary self and our DNA is the need for eating those foods that our ancestors did to keep us healthy. For instance, us Lakota, we were hunter-gatherers. We were not so much farmers who would actually grow our own crops and eat them in, in such a way to be a more vegetarian in our, 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 our lifestyle. So we used a lot of the meat. We used a lot of meats and that I believe is a part of our DNA. There's multiple studies out there that shows buffalo meat helping our people rid themselves of diabetes. And that is very critical. There's not enough studies done but I've seen some incredible studies where they have, uh, our people have eaten this uh, regularly and they slowly took it away from them, but still gave it to them very seldom. And their, their uh, control of their diabetic uh, uh, state was very under control. And it was an amazing, uh, uh, study that was done about the buffalo and the Lakota people. I believe they did it with uh, um, four different uh, tribal uh, entities of the Lakota. But 
the meat itself is very nutritious and and it carries so much protein it carries you a long way a little piece of this meat now there are some other foods with the buffalo that uh, not too many are familiar with i happen to have with me from February. I don't know if you could see it, but it's a frozen tripe or stomach of the buffalo. We have a particular name we call it Tanija. And this is a very delicious food. Oh my goodness. We use it uh, regularly. And if you notice, the coloring, it is not bleached. It has been washed, but there is still residue from the stomach of the buffalo on that. Our people believe that gave the actual tripe more, it does, uh, I believe it too, it gives the tripe a lot more flavor and it, it also, gives us a lot of nutrition with it instead of uh, just buying the store-bought bleach or having the buffalo bleached, the tanija or stomach, um, having it bleached is, is like taking away all the nutritious properties and it really has no taste. But this is a great, another great food that was provided by the buffalo. So, with the buffalo, the wasna and the bapa, comes other food sources on the end when you could say we were um, hunting for these foods. Of course, we needed other things such as choke cherries and the wild turnip, the timsila. Uh, the timsila right now grows only in ditch, the wild turnip, um, the one my people, the Lakota favored and used regularly, um, only grows in the wild now in South Dakota. And that is because uh, the wild herds, nomadic herds of buffalo no longer exist to help spread the Timsila in the Northern Plains. At one time, Timsila covered states as far west as Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Minnesota. The buffalo spread the seeds of the, the Timsila or the wild tournament that far by its migration patterns. It, once the buffalo was, was uh, decimated in North America and taken from us, it also affected some, a lot of the ecosystems. A lot of the prairie grasses no longer grow in certain areas of the high plains because the buffalo no longer exist to spread the seeds, to spread the roots, to plow the land with its hooves. Those are some of the things that we will never have access to unless we find a way to recreate some of the natural environmental uh, ways of Unchimaka, Unchi Grandmother Earth, and Wankantanka creation that the buffalo uh, did for us, and that's why we have the special names, the Pete uh, Oyate, for it, because we knew the things it did for us as a people and allowed us the nourishment we seek for, to remain here on uh, Turtle Island. So, with that, the Timsila, I would like to show some photos, if I may, of the Timsila. 
and I'd like to have the first one up, if I may. You could put that up for us. There, Desiree. Yep, give me just one second to get it open. Teamsala is, is a great food. It, it You could keep it all year and it really needs no special place. This is what, what the actual plant looks like. This particular plant is found between the Black Hills in South Dakota, the, uh, um, the Badlands, uh, the Black Hills in the West, the bad ha uh, badlands in the east, and it it will grow as far north, uh, almost to the Missouri River of North around North Dakota, the border of North Dakota and South Dakota, and it's it, it does grow right at the uh, border of South Dakota and Nebraska, real close to there. But there are many spots where this plant actually grows. Could I have a second one there, Des? Three. That's a more close up of it. As you could see where the the actual turnip lives in Unchi Maka in its home and mother earth. That uh, is what you're looking to harvest there. What what you would look at when you begun to harvest that plant. It's uh, a very, very nutritious plant. Do I have the next photo? And there is the bulb or root, harvested bulb or root of the timsila, the wild turnip that would be picked from the ground. You note know they have the uh, bulbs on them and the roots follow. Now they will be, they're cleaned, washed and peeled of all the brown that you see. Can we have the next slide please, Des, Ray? There you go. There's a nice little harvest of Team Sela. Uh, that would probably take you all day to harvest and multiple people because the, the bulbs and the the uh, turnips have to be dug out individually. And they come in many sizes, from the size of maybe a cherry tomato to the size, uh, I've seen them pretty big, to the size of a, uh, uh, a baseball that the major leaguers use to play baseball with. Pretty good size. Uh, next slide, please. This is a very large, nice one here. Uh, as you could see, it's very large in its size. So when cooking this particular uh, plant, uh, the turnip, after you have cleaned it and taken all the outside skin off, um, you would probably have to boil if you cooked it right away, while it still had a lot, was hydrated, it would probably take you, oh, three to four hours to cook this particular bulb, maybe even longer. I, I, I believe more like five to six, excuse me, five to six with this size, it's very large, uh, to boil it at high heat continuously in order to, for it to be consumable. It's extremely hard and it takes a lot to cook those. Now, if you dried that particular one and let it sit for a few months and then rehydrate it, you have to soak it for at least a, at least a day, a day and a half to rehydrate it. Then it would probably take you all day to cook that more like eight hours to cook it on high heat so there there's a lot of cooking when it comes to uh, a lot of preparation with these could i have the uh 
Next slide, please. Now this is some that has been sliced up that was uh, kind of extra there so that they used it to slice it up. You can slice it up while it's still hydrated and add it to soup and it does cook a lot faster. Something, some of these pieces can probably cook, be cooked in two under, oh, I would say at least two to three hours. Um, but uh, very tasty. They kind of look like potatoes. Next, please. There's my friend, Dana K. Richards. Oh, there we go. There's my friend, Dana. Wow. There's one of her braids that she harvested a few weeks ago. Now, they take the root that is attached to the turnip and braid it from small to large. And the, these braids can be hung on the wall. They, our ancestors hung them within the teepee and they would last all year till the next year's harvest of Timsala. So they, they were very important and they were a very uh, nomadic travel, fast food, you could call it although it took quite a while to cook it, but they were a great nutrition source. Could I have the last slide, please? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Now, not everyone has access to these or everyone can find this many, Team Sila, but this is a good harvest. A couple braids like this would last a family of three. Um, and sustaining themselves on something like this, prop with say some bapa, it you could easily make that last uh, about eight to nine months uh, with a family of three. It's very good stuff. Thank you, Desiree, for um, helping us with those photos. Sure, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so basically. Uh, as you see, our our ancestors, our mine in particular, the Lakota, we we did a lot of of gathering, and we we would trade with other tribes for some of these nutritious uh, vegetables and foods, and the buffalo was the mainstay, always the main course, and it not only provided that nutrition, but everything else that we could possibly want that our people did, including the teepee, um, hides for staying warm, our clothing, all the leather, the strapping that it takes to put up a teepee. So the buffalo is, it was very important because it was also key to the expansion of the Timsila in the Great Plains. Now, without that, without the uh, herds of buffalo roaming the Great Plains, where we're losing our, our certain things, our, our indigenous foods like the Timsila, these harvests, the one that the pictures you see of my friend Dana um, holding up the braids, that's about all anybody would be able to get fined for the season for one family. Uh, back when uh, the buffalo roamed the high plains, that would be that same harvest would be for one family would could be up to five to six times that amount, and in different spaces that in environments around. In, in the high plains as they traveled uh, um, following the buffalo herds. So um, it's very important that we take care of some of these food sources and they're not always uh, accessible to us. And because we now consume so much beef and the power of 
the beef industry and the cattle industry um, really overtaking the markets for our meat consumption that they literally control who even gets a herd of buffalo as far as tribal people get. Now there's uh, a few disturbing things in Yellowstone every year they have an overpopulation of buffalo and because of the beef industry and the cattle industries lobbying with the National Park Service uh, the Park Service instead of giving live buffalo to the tribes to start new herds uh, they are met with uh, uh, opposition by the beef industry and cattle industry to uh, destroy the buffalo, to shoot them on site and take out a large number of, excuse me, number of the herd. And that's unacceptable. They make a lot of excuses um, about disease and the buffalo claiming that it would um, spread uh, uh, berculosis and other diseases to the cattle. So they really convinced the uh, National Park Service to destroy the buffaloes instead of giving it to tribal people. Because if there's one thing the cattle industry is scared of, and it is the buffalo, that those herds and that access to that meat, that nutritious meat, that is so much more than beef, that is naturally grazed on natural grasses and, and uh, roots such as the Timsila on the high plains, that they are extremely afraid that there'll be a resurgent um, consume a resurgence consuming the buffalo. So those are some of the things we're up against when it comes to accessing our foods, whether it's one industry or another, uh, we have to fight uh, for those foods that will allow us to create uh, a more sovereign nation for our people and definitely a healthier nation. So I encourage everyone to please help with um, indigenous sovereign foods access in any way possible, support any indigenous foods and uh, help uh, in its the access of those foods. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's um, uh, patience with me today. I'm uh, a little bit uh, hungry here. I've been waiting and waiting to uh, indulge in some of this food and I wish you was here to share some of this with me. Um, that is one of the things that we always do is, would be to share our foods as native people. As you enter my teepee, the first thing I would do was share some of my bapa, wasna, and my timsala with you. So I wanna kind of thank everyone and uh, Desiree, how about how much time do we got left there, hon? Looks like about 10 minutes. And we got a good comment in the chat from Rosetta that just says, wonderful history of the Buffalo and Team Sila. Great. Do you want to take, should we do some questions and answers or something? Mm -hmm. Have a little bit longer question and answer period? Sure. That sounds good. Well, that's why we get to interact with each other instead of listening to me just talking up the buffalo. <laughs> Could you tell us maybe a story about the Timsila that has a lesson attached to it? I know that I've heard some stories about how some sisters were digging Team Sila and one had a husband who got jealous and so she was closer to her family by picking the Team Sila? Uh, I know a story, but it, it, it's about some uh, 
some tribal people, some Lakota people picking uh, Timsila, and they came across a different plant. Um, would you like to hear that story? Yes, please. Okay. Well, um, there was a group of, of women and men out uh, hunting and and uh, looking for foods, and they came across the timsila. So the men were hunting uh, nearby, and the women started to dig the timsila. Uh, they walked up on a, uh, a, a another plant that looked a little out of place, but our ancestors had those the knowledge of of the environments and and the life that it held so much that they they wanted to uh, they explored and and they thought maybe this could be another food. Well, they started to dig and they realized it was a root, and they kept digging and kept digging and pretty soon they seen like something like this a very huge root this this is a grandfather a sacred uh stone used for ceremony but it looks very similar to this you notice the 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 pock marks on it that's what they seen it looks like pock marks indentations like a golf ball but it was very large looked like i don't know almost the top of someone's head well they kept digging and digging and before you know it the root it looked like it had shoulders so they continued digging and before they could realize it they had dug down approximately three feet or so. And what they were looking at was a root who looked like a man. And that root drew the attention of everyone, even the men that were hunting nearby. As they came to get, um, to look at that root, they decided they wanted to pull it all out of the ground. Well, as they went about to pull it out of the ground, it was extremely difficult because it, it was probably another foot or so, even farther buried from the two and a half, three feet they already undug. Well, as they pulled the, the root out of the ground, it made a shrill, almost a scream. It shrieked like a person. And they dropped it and ran away. And they wasn't sure what to think of this plant. Well, they found later, they called some of the headsmen and the elders to come look at that plant and they all told what they how they discovered it and and what they had heard that it called out when it was removed from unchi maka grandmother earth from its living space in that environment right there so the elders in that uh, they they called it the um pejuta wichasha so they did call it medicine man. As today, you know, the Pejuta Wichasha means a real man who delves in the healing and the spirituality of native people. That's how we think what we think of when we think of um, the words medicine man. The, those Lakota people called that plant Pejuta Wichasha, medicine man. So 
they weren't too sure what to do with it. So the, the medicine people took it back and they tried consuming some of it. And they found that some people it took to another world and others it did not affect at all. So they knew it was a special medicine and you had to be in, um, the right being or the, at the right frame of mind in order to accept that medicine. So they began to use it in certain ceremonies, uh, umblecha when they would go on the vision quest or in sun dances, they would use it to help the sun dancers. But they found that it was really hard to hear that that being, that root, that pejuta, uh, wichasha scream when they removed it and, it and it was unnerving to them and they did not want to hear it they wanted the medicine but they did not want to hear it they believed it was bad luck to hear it or it was it it it, it turned the uh Hejuta wichasha to lose its potency when it was harvested if it was heard by human ears so they came up a way to devise, uh, they devised a way to harvest that particular plant. When they find it, and this is used today too, in and special ceremony to harvest that plant for, like I said, humblecha or Sundance ceremonies, they would undig the plant around to the shoulders, like this area of the head to the shoulders because that's what's kind of protruding from the ground. They would then take and attach thongs or ropes to that and tie a number of dogs up to that root. Then they would take and put some meat that was, oh, a distance away, but close enough that the dogs knew that they were there. So they would set this up in such a way and leave. So when the dogs were got hungry enough, they would literally pull the plant from the ground to get to the meat. So they would do the work and not, and it, it wasn't the human that had to hear that shrill scream that the, that plant Pejuta we chasha made. And we all know that plant today, or some of us do, as the mandrake. But it does grow wild next to the Timsila, and it is found in that same area of South Dakota. And it's an incredible plant to see. The last one I seen was approximately four feet long. And it had to be cut with an elect a, a saw, an electric saw, because it was just too thick, uh, and it take very long time to cut with a knife. But it's incredible medicine, and and the some of the reasoning uh, medical science has for not using it is it's unpredictable. Certain parts of the roof are very impotent. Other parts are just incredibly potent and can become dangerous, but it always changes within the root. And that's why our people believe some people would not have visions with it while others would. And that is the story of the mandrake and how I heard it was created or, or found and given to our people next to the team sila. but if it wasn't for that team sila and us looking for it, we wouldn't have found that particular ceremonial medicine. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Des? Rick? Yeah. Um, for those on this class, the the mandrake is really this. It's literally the size of your head. Like it looks like a human head sitting there with these like shoulders. You, it's 
Yes, the mandrake looks like the, a whole human body. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting. Well, um, yeah. We oh, You've excuse. made me hungry with the with the wasna showing off the wasna. Shall I eat some and let you know how it tastes? <laughs> that might be kind of cruel, Sid. It is delicious. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> I want to give credit to Miss Early Don Roy for preparing the wasna for me. Sorry, I did not have time. And I know she makes the most delicious wasna. So, because I was going to eat it after the presentation. I um, asked her to make it for, for me. Mm -hmm. So I just want to acknowledge her. <laughs> and by the way, she's not Lakota, but she is uh, Meskwaki in Pueblo, but she does know how to make a good wasna. And she is uh, with my uh, brother, who is uh, Sinchanghu Lakota, who probably taught her how to make it too. Mm -hmm. Have places been getting over harvested? That's a question from Rosetta. It's it's easy to over harvest like the Teamsala, but a lot of the, the people such as my friend Dana who harvest that Teamsala, uh, they, they, they know enough to leave the young sprouts and they do leave a portion of them. And they also can tell when those plants are, are, are pollinating and, and going to reproduce and that sort of thing. But uh, they're hard to find. Uh, you, don't, you don't just find them real easy. It takes a lot of looking. And um, cattle, if it's nearby and grazing, don't like the uh, taste of the the teamsilla leaf, so they'll leave it alone. But as far as like, you can probably, I would think, start a garden of your own and try growing it. Mm -hmm. I would think you could grow it that way. I'm I'm not um, really familiar with it growing that way, and I don't know exactly. Um, what nutritious uh, uh, elements it might need to to grow, but it does grow in 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 the the an arid uh, um, setting as as in the high plains. But as, as we know, with climate change, that same setting has really became uh, a lot more humid with a lot more precipitation for the year. So I, I believe that helps the Teamsila in, 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 in to expand, but as of now, we have yet to found it, find it outside of South Dakota. And uh, we're pretty sure it's because of the buffalo migration is no longer there to uh, help it expand into the rest of the plains areas. I hope that helped. Anyone else have a qu question on anything, the buffalo, or how about why we don't bleach the uh, tanija, the cow's stomach, when we turn it into soup? Well, that, you think it's pretty yucky because it has a pungent odor when you're cooking it, and you only wash it with water and rinse off some of the bile that's naturally in the stomach, but you do get some, a little portion that's inside that particular stomach. And as you boil it to cook it, of course it kills all the bacteria and anything that 
the bile originally had in it. But we, some of us believe that by consuming some of these things like the taniha and, have, and, and being able to eat that with the actual stomach bile in there, that it ad actually added to our immune systems. So our foods didn't have to be so much sterilized as we took them regularly in such manners. Nowadays, of course, we have to sterilize everything because we, are, are, we cannot uh, consume foods in that manner. They have to be cleaned and, and thoroughly washed and um, things like salmonella and food poisonings. Um, devastate us, can kill you, make you extremely sick. But uh, some of the uh, indigenous foods, uh, we believe they had natural protections built into them that when consumed, made for a healthier uh, person. I don't know if anyone wanted to hear that. <laughs> of course. So I kind of wanted to double back into the conversation about access and indigenous foods and um, just kind of revisit that because there's a lot of people who kind of assume that indigenous foods are especially non non natives and kind of like settler people they assume that indigenous foods are harmful because we tend to eat off the land which also involves uh animals and so i kind of wanted to talk about one how our access to food is connected to not only land acknowledgement but food sovereignty and land back you know, so that we can kind of bring our traditions back, but also too how it's in, tied into health and the environment when we're on these things. You know, I know you mentioned the refrigeration process. You know, and so having these types of foods, it, it's just it just ties into a very healthy, robust human you know, land interaction with this food. And, and you can see that through the Lakota food traditions, how important it is. So I kind of wanted to get back to that. And if anybody has any comments regarding food sovereignty or land back or, you know, any of these things, just because I, I think that, you know, having these three elements, the Bapa, the Wasna, and the Timsila just shows how important indigenous food really is and i don't think we get enough recognition as the original the traditional the ancestral and honestly the future of the americas so i don't know if anybody has any comments or want to double back to that or any statements but i think we could turn on the turn off the mics at this point and let everybody just have an organic discussion. Thank you for that, Brooke. I appreciate it. That, that really needs to be the discussion that we have is our access to the different foods, not only the ones that we grow in our gardens and, and that are found on certain reservations and, and, in indigenous lands, but um, these animals like the buffalo, the deer, the elk, uh, you know, the, the, the pheasant, the wild pheasant, the wild turkey, those are things that um, a lot of us don't have access to. I do because I'm a hunter and I do own part of a buffalo ranch. So I'm able to access buffalo on a yearly basis, but I only, I don't have a lot of buffalo and my steak is small. So I get to share one buffalo and that has to last me all year. And most of the time, uh, if I'm eating alone, it will, but 
I need to share with my relatives, uh, as I stated, I cannot be selfish and, and indulge in that buffalo by myself. It, it, it's uh, such importance to our people. But access to those types of, of animals, even in hunting our own, our own uh, reservation lands is, is quite difficult for even some people. Um, there's not enough licensing, maybe. There's not enough animals to accommodate everyone. Uh, different scenarios tend to play out. The tribal buffalo herds are too small to sustain everyone. So as they grow, grow those herds, they, they try to distribute the meat to the needy, the elderly, the young, the families. But um, um, it's very difficult even for a, a tribal entity uh, in some cases to uh, uh, begin to access those foods. And as far as some of our native people are concerned, the Timpsila, it does grow off reservation lands into state and private properties up there in South Dakota and federal properties. So um, access can be denied in some of those places by those other entities that um, took ownership of that environment and no longer allows access to it. And that's directly tied into settler colonialism. Because, right, what does settler colonialism do? It goes into territories, steals land, privatizes it, and then removes indigenous people, removes indigenous people, privatizes it, and then creates, you know, let's say the cow industry, industrial meats, or monocropping, which then creates these weird barriers that have never existed but within the last few hundred years. And so the land is trying to figure out and the Buffalo are trying to figure out, okay, well, we've been doing this thousands of years. Now we have these weird barriers, these inorganic barriers that come here. And for example, the cow industry for what? Maybe a few products, dairy, you have cheese, yogurt, milk, uh, and then the meat, right? So like four products. It destroyed 80% of the wetlands in North America. You know, it, it destroyed the buffalo migrations on top of, you know, the settlement. So what we have to understand is like these things are directly tied into settler colonialism and privatization of stolen land. And um, these need to be national conversations when it comes to indigenous uh, food sovereignty especially in the North, the two are inseparable. You cannot talk about living off the land and being as, you know, following original instructions when it comes to food culture and food knowledge. And as you said, it's like, basically the buffalo are like the bees of Team Sila. You, It would be really hard for us to recreate that and that's what's happening with the bees, right? And everybody's getting scared because it's really hard for us to create those systems once they're gone. Because those systems have taken, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of a relationship, you know, between our cultures, between the, the animal nations and the plant nations and between the soil and the earth. So I think it's really important through this um, series that we understand that food sovereignty, land back, and access is just something that's always going to be intertwined. You can't talk about one without the other. And um, I just really appreciate, you know, having you here, Sid. And um, if anybody else has any comments, statements, suggestions, protests, we accept them all here. <laughs> I wanted to say one more thing. I wanted to show you guys one more thing, just just because I needed to make all of you a little more disgusted. Oh. But, <laughs> a 
If you know what this is, who knows what this is? Cow patty. It looks like a cow patty, like a dried cow patty. Yes, it's a buffalo patty, okay? Now this patty here was nature's planting pot. It held much different indigenous seeds and incredible nutrients and was planted across the Great Plains and spread all of those indigenous plants and grasses throughout the whole continent of America, the whole, and, and it, this, this particular thing also was used by our people as fire, uh, uh, the firewood of the prairie. There was, there was, there is no trees on the high prairie, very few. So our people would use this, the dried um, buffalo patties to cook with. So this is also had its own flavoring, so to speak. But this is what we use to cook with. And this is a very important piece that is missing right now in the high plains. Thanks for letting me do that. Now you're probably not hungry, are you? <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments for Sid? That was our very first patty on <laughs> First Foods. <laughs> I believe Rosetta has a comment about um, accessing foods. Rosetta wants to talk. Um, I live in Tempe, Arizona, out in the desert here, desert Southwest. And we generally don't get access to traditional foods. I know that there's some urban places that you can go buy mutton, you can buy certain foods, but they're not readily available to us. You know, if I went to go out and try to buy buffalo, I probably couldn't find it here in the valley in the southwest in Phoenix, Arizona. So things like that, and I, and I know that they're so nutritional, I know that it leads to, you know, our health and well being but we don't have access to it, even in this large urban area. So I know you said you have a ranch. So do you sell online or who would you suggest that we could, you know, do outreach to, to order online to, to get some Buffalo steaks or bison or what type of, you know, that type of traditional foods, how do we access it? Um, I think that was addressed to me, the question. Um, I, well, we don't really sell a lot. We, we uh, tend to give them away. We give them to uh, certain tribes and to certain people who have ceremonies. Uh, we also are raising the Denver Zoo's buffalo down there. It's uh, on the Eastern Plains, 20 miles north of the Oklahoma border by Springfield, Colorado. Um, but we don't really sell the buffalo. Um, we harvest it ourselves. Maybe sometimes we might sell a buffalo or two, but not a whole lot. Um, they're really easy to care for. So we don't really buy hay and things to, um, we do get a little supplement, but they roam the, the, the prairie down there. And, and it is very arid in that area, but they survive just fine. Um, there, there is tribal, um, um, groups um, like I believe one of them's the National Bison Coalition who do sell some uh, who do sell
Buffalo, and uh, there is Buffalo Ranchers, of course, with uh, Ted, uh, um, Jane Fonda's husband, Ted, I forget his last name. He has a Buffalo Ranch here in Colorado up by, on the other side of Fort Collins between the Wyoming and Fort Collins, Colorado border. What's his name? Ted. I can't think. Turner. He's Ted, Ted Turner. Turner. There you go. Uh, thank you. <laughs> He's married to Jane Fonda is all I know. Uh, but like someone like that, you can uh, specifically uh, start a relationship with them and they will uh, literally at certain times of the years prepare a package for you and have it delivered to you kind of on a consistent basis once you let them know that you're interested in um, harvesting or, or um, um, consuming some of their their products, some of their meats. Some are better than others. Some are prairie grass-fed buffalo and others are ranch-fed. And I personally love the uh, uh, grass-fed buffalo and not the uh, ranch fed, which would mean uh, uh, genetically modified hay and grasses fed to the buffalo. And some of them, they, they even try to uh, give them uh, steroids and antibiotics that uh, really the buffalo does not need. And that, that was part of my, my point when I, I talked about the National Park Service and Yellowstone National Park the cattle industry has such a stranglehold on everything. And you, you really seen it in the, this pandemic when they, the cattle industry literally raised the prices of beef doubled during the pandemic and, and said there were shortages uh, caused by the packing houses, by employees not being able to work. Well, just prior to the pandemic, they told the ranchers they had too much beef and couldn't purchase their cattle. So they made the ranchers lower their price because they had stockpiled beef. Now, when the pandemic broke out, they turned around and, and said the exact opposite. So what is the real truth about these scenarios that they're putting forth? And what is, what, what is happening to us as the consumer? Why, why have we um, suddenly had a difficult time, <coughs> excuse me, accessing even beef? We can't afford it like the buffalo. The a buffalo ribeye steak right now an eight ounce one is about $17, a little more. Uh, well, that was prior to the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, it was about 17 and a quarter, something like that. But I haven't looked, I haven't seen it in stores or anything. So I bet it's went up quite a bit now. You're, we're probably talking over $25 for that same steak, eight ounce sirloin buffalo steak. So those are some of the problems with access. Thank you very much for addressing that and answering my question. Um, I am from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. My father was Rosebud Sioux and my mom was from Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And I remember going out onto the prairie as a young girl and harvesting Timpsala on the prairie up there on the uh, reservation. And, and you have to have an eye for that. You have to know what you're looking for because I would be walking, just, just walking nonchalantly across the prairie and my, my dad would stop and he'd have his little spade and he would stick his shovel into the ground and dig some up when I would didn't even see it I would have walked right by it so it, it's quite a talent and thank you for keeping the traditions alive though 
I, I really appreciate that. You know, I, it's been uh, quite some time since I've been back up to the reservation. I've lived down here in Arizona for, you know, over 20 years. And, but those stories that you tell, and, and it's really heartwarming. And I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And you sound like a very knowledgeable person who happens to be from the same reservation as myself. So I know you know what I'm talking about and very smart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any quick questions we could answer? I just wanted to add that um, in terms of gaining access, aside from creating networks, of kind of like an indigenous food highway. It, it, that's more like for us to do and kind of really work on inter, inter tribally. Um, but also in terms of allies and kind of also things that we need to work on, part of gaining access is having proper representation. So if indigenous people are seeing that the proper representation is not being done. We have to be more vocal, um, but also in spaces where it's being created by non-native people, you need to seek proper, I don't know what the word would be, but proper, I don't wanna say authority because that's such an ugly word. <laughs> I don't know, Sid, help me out. I think you understand what I'm saying here. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I really do. Uh, and, you know, what you're saying is I've come across something similar. I've been asked by the uh, United Nations delegation, the FOA, um, Food Organization and Agriculture Department. They have a indig uh, indigenous people's uh, food sovereign food sovereignty committee and that committee has no native people from uh, North America from the Mexican border all the way to the Arctic Circle indigenous real tribal indigenous people don't have an official uh, member of the UN sitting on that committee and that's because we're being blocked by the United States recently Canada has kind of opened up and allowed one indigenous lady to interact with that committee and they've also allowed uh, an employee of that FOA the United Nations FOA uh, to begin looking for indigenous people to find those knowledgeable people to represent North America and the uh, foods of indigenous people. And I believe they're looking for maybe five people out of the thousands of us. So who's gonna be qualified? Would it be me? Because I know about meat and uh, um, you know, harvesting in, in a different way? Or is it about someone else who knows how to grow some of these traditional foods, like the beans, the rice, the corn, the three sisters? You know, who is going to be the ones to represent? Is it going to be a college professors, tribal people who own a buffalo herd or, or massive uh, uh uh, gardens that provide for their people. Um, there's a lot of questions. And one of their biggest questions is, how do we solve the problem of access to those foods? And that uh, is going to be one of the questions we're all going to have to try to solve as, as a group of indigenous people worldwide not just us here but worldwide that 
really needs to uh, uh, come out and, and, and we need to have start having discussions. And no matter how small the contribution is uh, to, I believe everyone has something worthy to offer. I know certain individuals who are just as knowledgeable as entire universities, as big as the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. But I know there, there are people who, who have this knowledge. So do we, who do we get? The individuals or the heads of these organizations and I'm afraid that when it comes to someone like the United Nations, they're going to pick the head of a large organization or tribe over some really powerful individuals who know what they're doing and, and have great plans for accessing these indigenous foods and creating sort of a, uh, a moving sovereignty. They do it amongst individuals they teach to become sovereign in their food sources and don't have to rely on the Ted Turner's Buffalo ranches and other sources to get these indigenous foods. So good question, Brooke. Yeah, thank you for that. I think it's just really important when we talk about access that it's multiple layers. It's a really big issue because, you know, we have improper representation a lot of times in Indian country, not just, you know, in food issues, but just general, uh, even how we're represented in the film, the media, the news, or the lack of representation in the news and the media, right? It's a it's very small, like, reference of Indigenous people. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention in terms of access is that because it's so layered and how do we deal with this issue, it has to be um, kind of like rapid movement in many sections. So indigenous people, I don't um, discourage indigenous people from working with organizations. I think we need as much visibility as possible because we are on stolen lands and, and not visible. That's like a double whammy. I don't think people understand the weight of pressure that does to indigenous communities to be one, our land stolen and two, to be invisible and our voices are always kind of weirdly recreated to fit an odd kind of romantic narrative. Um, so this has to be many layers. And I guess the point I'm trying to say is that it, it we can work with the UN, we can work with institutions, we can work intertribally, we can work individually, we can work locally, regionally, nationally, interstate, every piece counts. So every voice counts, regardless of who picks up the mic, who picks up the, the, you know, the shovel, if you want to call it, who picks up the bag of seeds, every voice, every action counts towards that bucket because we're in a very short window when it comes to our food systems and quite honestly, being in union and back in relationship with our mother territories. It's a very short window we have. So whether it's local gardening, whether it's seed collection and preservation, whether it's in exchanging with those, those communities and making ceremonies again with communities that you haven't been in good standing with for a while. Whether, like I said, for non-native non people, opening up spaces. Every time you have something, consult the indigenous tribes. Every time, whether it's the removal of a statue, whether if, if it's putting up a, a new commercial building, whether it's putting up a store, consult, re-bring back in, make intention, strong intentions for native, for non-natives especially, strong intentions to always find whose ancestral territory is this? How do I operate through land acknowledgement? Because land acknowledgement it is more than just the statement. It is an ideology. It is a practice. It is a culture that you are, are going to not be performing under settler colonialism. 
because a lot of times people think settler colonialism is something from 1492 and it's not. It is repackaged every time you, you push out indigenous community and reduce the space of indigenous communities, traditional territories. And it's not our fault. You know, it's not the fault of people who are coming in. Uh, a lot of people are on, uh, or aren't really aware that they're performing under settler colonialism. Um, but it's time that our fault isn't enough. We have to now educate ourselves and we have to figure out, okay, if this is what I'm doing as a non-native person, I am, you know, taking land or utilizing land. How am I doing that with respect to traditional uh, territories and especially the people who have the knowledge to get us back into relationship with the land? So as non-natives, just a recap, really, really important. Get in contact with your uh, communities that are next to you, or even if they've been displaced, still get in contact with them. See how you can either have them come back into the space or back into the fold. Put pressure on your local, your, your governments and the leaders that you're picking to make sure that they are having a native voice represented consistently. Like I said, if you're not doing these things, land acknowledgement is nice, but it's not in practice. And that's what we need when we when it comes to terms of access. We need non-natives to start centering indigenous voices every single time, every single action, every single rally, every single thing when it comes to the land, every time. Not one moment should it be dismissed. That, that was really some good words there, Brooke. Uh, you know, when we talk about access, as the other uh, young lady from uh, Rosebud spoke about as she walked right past the Timsala plant, that I think said it all. It's invisibility of native foods. Uh, because when that, those, when native foods are brought um, to the forefront, then, then the questions about land and access to those lands uh, comes up and it becomes a, 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 I don't wanna hear it kind of thing. And we'll just continue to do, make our Monsanto corn style, uh, 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 hybrid corn and feed you that. You know, that's uh, that's what kind of happens. So we really do have to bring that visibility out as well as that um, make sure that the visibility and the access are all there. And like you said, all different types of indigenous people need to bring what they have. And, and it even goes to sacred medicines. Sacred medicines like sage, cedar, bear root, all those things, they are part of our mental well-being and our physical self's well-being. So a lot of these things all walk hand in hand together and Oh, Sid, your um, voice is coming off. It should be back now. Try again, Sid. Oh, sorry, did I get cut off there? Yeah, yeah, you're here. Out of it. Were there any other questions for Sid or commentary before we wrap up? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I think um, there's a lot of really good work that's that is being done with the restoration of the buffalo and the bison. And I wanted to know if Sid, if you've encountered any positive things from either the Buffalo Treaty that um, Leroy Little Bear 
has been leading and then a lot of nations have signed on to it and or the uh intertribal buffalo council and i know that's usually just for you'd mention the tribes have buffalo herds that don't necessarily have enough meat to feed a larger community but i feel like the buffalo what we're talking about how the if you support the buffalo it will um it's a it's a and a, what do you call it? Like it, it a lot of things will get restored when that animal gets restored including the the prairie turnip and um and i think a lot of these all these things are intertwined and you work on one and it will like it will it will um uh, domino out and other things can get restored but i'm just wondering if you have any um in, I don't know, interaction with any of the restoration programs um, that are working on Buffalo. Well, if you think the Buffalo restoring that, as you were saying, it, it, it supports all these other things and including the dung, using the dung for fuel is really important. And then there's more uses of the dung and the dung is really important, not just for the human livelihood, but like the plants and the animals and the insects. And, and, and anyway, just wonder if you have any comments on the restoration um processes that are out there well um yeah there's there's a lot of them there's a lot of them and they're kind of dotted all over the place and where you'll have a, a certain groups of tribes getting together and trying to restore um herds in in within their territories and uh, you have tribes who are trying to release the buffalo into the wild, into federal territories that border uh, traditional lands. Um, there are um, tribal people like, I believe, uh, our tribe, Rosebud, um, made an announcement they're going to have the largest tribally owned buffalo herd in the nation now i don't know all the details but they made that public announcement so i don't know there's a lot of different uh moving parts here when you come when you talk about the positive aspects and it and it's really good i mean even here denver colorado uh the uh Denver Mountain Park system has 48 little parks scattered throughout mountain parks, they call them, scattered out uh, throughout the state, all the way from the, uh, the uh, Continental Divide out east here to Denver. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, they gave us access to one years ago, and we call that Tall Bull Memorial Grounds. And it's not named after a buffalo. It's named after Chief Tall Bull of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. That was his uh, kind of area, his grounds. But with that being said, out there, uh, there is a herd of buffalo, approximately 75. Five, I believe, and that herd uh, that is owned by the city of Denver. And every year they harvest one or they let us harvest one. Uh, we can take it by bow and arrow and uh, um, um, distribute the meat in the fall. Uh, oh, excuse me, in the uh, uh, late winter. I believe it's in like February is when they allow us to harvest one. But they also have another mountain park up at Lookout Mountain, which is between the two parks, they're about maybe 40 miles away from each other. But uh, that park consists of a hundred head of bi uh, buffalo or bison, but they only give us native, the native community one buffalo, uh, a uh, year but I see steps like that you know when 
an entire city takes ownership and 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 tries to uh, um, um, put into something like the uh, those herds of buffalo because they knew they were indigenous to these lands here in the eastern plains of Colorado. And they felt a responsibility to do that as well as when they gave us this space uh, south of town for us to utilize for our ceremonies and our social gatherings, powwows or whatever, uh, they, they believe that uh, be, after a lot of uh, talking with them, that it was important for them to bring back the buffalo also. So there is uh, positive things. Uh, another herd uh, at the old Rocky Mountain Arsenal that were not, no one's allowed to have, have any of the meat they're growing that herd. Uh, it was a old uh, chemical munitions plant kind of uh, out um, northeast of where I'm at, northeast of Denver, that the land's been cleaned up and reclaimed, but still might be a little contaminated. But uh, those are things that cities and people can do. Uh, individuals like myself, if tribal people ask for a specific matriarchal cow that we have, we will give it to them, or sometimes we'll trade it for just another cow. Sometimes we trade for a herd bull, a bull that dominates the entire herd that can lead that herd and, and lead it in a healthy way. Um, so those are some of the positive things besides a lot of the tribal coalitions, especially the ones in Wyoming, Montana, uh, South Dakota, and in a uh, few uh, uh, Minnesota, a few other spaces up there that are fighting the cattle industry so they can get more flexibility and, and move uh, some of the buffalo herds, some of the buffalo that they have to market in order to build a larger herd. And, and they also are requesting free range buffalo but we're getting a lot of feedback from uh, a lot of fight from those uh, cattle lobbyists who are saying that the buffalo are going to spread the disease disease to the cattle industry. Ridiculous statements they're making. So there's a lot of positive stuff. I can go on and on, but uh, just telling you, trying to answer your question. Thank you so much, Sid, for being able to answer that so thoroughly. Um, we're over time, so I do apologize for that. Um, you know, one and a half hours when you start having discussions like these can go by really fast. And um, just apologizing to anybody who may have had questions. Um, if you do have questions, you can either send them to me or Desiree. And uh, we'll try working with something to answer those questions later on. But um, just apologies for that. If anybody wanted to say anything or had a question or suggestions or comments. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Desiree for last minute announcements. Unless Sid, you want to say anything else or? Uh, yes, it's dinner time, Rocky Mountain time. I'm about ready to dig in here so we can't be going overtime anymore okay not when it's my dinner time especially with this food thank you all for listening to my my uh ranting and raving i hope uh we all i hope we all learned something from this conversation we had today and and learned something about indigenous foods and indigenous food sovereignty but Pilamia, Wopila Tanka, celebrate creation. Thank you.
I will see you again, my relatives. Toksha Ake. And with that, everyone, thank you so much for coming to First Foods. Sid, that was fascinating and like just a wonderful class. Thank you for coming. Um, I believe that he's actually in the group. So if you have questions for Sid, be like, I have a question for Sid and put it in the group. I see him shaking his head. So he's there and happy to answer questions. So um, yeah. As always, I do an announcement at the end, you know, make sure that you come back for uh, our weekly class, but also at the end of the month, we're doing a panel where the instructors from this whole month come back. So you'll be seeing Sid again if you have questions and you wanted to ask in person. So as always, thank you to our partner, Ibex Puppetry for the support to make this happen and have a good day. We'll catch you next week. Bye everyone.